We're looking at the captivity epistles, and we have just finished looking at the book of Colossians, and according to the outline, what follows right on the heels, bookwise, of Colossians is Philemon. Philemon. We're going to deal with the authorship, date, recipients, purpose, and characteristics, and we'll probably go rather quickly over the first four of those five mentioned categories and spend a little more time looking at some of the characteristics of this small, hidden, neglected book, because from these, at least some of these, we can draw uh, certain principles that are applicable for Christian life and conduct. So we'll deal with authorship, and some of what, a lot of what I've said regarding Colossians, when we studied that book particularly, and, and relating to the captivity epistles in general, will fill in some of the details of the background for this little book called Philemon. So if you open your Bible over to Philemon, you know it's a little small book before Hebrews, we'll deal with the authorship. Uh, and maybe I need to even start by saying this, that it is a short book, 25 verses, and the very brevity of the book, of this epistle, it was a letter originally written by Paul, was probably what caused it to be placed at the end of Paul's epistles, those epistles that are named internally as being written by the Apostle Paul. Hebrews is anonymous from the internal uh, information. But Philemon, you know, appears at the very end. You've got big books like Romans, big important books that begin the Pauline material. And I'm not disputing that or I'm not saying I've got a problem with it. I'm just saying that's why Philemon is hidden back here. I mean, don't we know a lot more about Romans than we do Philemon? In one regard. Maybe in another regard, it's easier to know more about Philemon than Romans because there's less to know. You only have 25 verses instead of 16 full meaty chapters. But Philemon is not very well known. I think its brevity also uh, explains why it's not very well known. Its brevity explains why it's placed here in the Pauline corpus at the end and not the middle or beginning. And its brevity also explains why it is so neglected. Not a lot of people know a lot about Philemon. If they did, they'd, you know, get out of their church buildings and meet in the home. Amen. Philemon is one book you can base that on. So the authorship, well, Paul names himself three times in verse 1, verse 9, verse 19. The author names himself as Paul, so we don't have any problems. Paul was the author of it. Twice he refers to himself as Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ in verses 1 and 9. So that places it among the captivity epistles. Verses 1 and 9, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Notice the third word, Paul, a prisoner, and then... The fourth from the last word in verse 9, prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he also calls himself in verse 9, the aged, A-G-E-D, the elder one, the older man. Well, those descriptions would certainly fit the Paul that we know in the New Testament. So I doubt it's any other Paul. It's the Paul that we know. The date is around A.D. 60. We won't try to defend that because that's on the earlier tape since it relates to the other captivity epistles. And no one knows now, was Colossians really the first one written at 9 a.m. and then Philemon at 4 p.m. or something? No one really knows that. But it seems as though Colossians was first and then Philemon, or you could reverse it, uh, and then Ephesians. Or you maybe could start with Ephesians, but then you definitely have to end uh, with Philippians. The recipients of the book. Recipients, well, you see it's named after the chief one, but there is a plurality of recipients. There's not a recipient like Timothy or Titus. It's really not group like that, and it really shouldn't be. It shouldn't be thought of like that, where Paul in those three letters, one and two, first and second Timothy and Titus, addresses it to a man, a leader, a representative of the Apostle Paul's. It's probably a little... Uh, off-center to call them pastors, although we sometimes call them the pastoral epistles, but they are apostolic representatives of the Apostle Paul in two different areas, Ephesus and Crete. Philemon, the book goes by that name Philemon because he's the chief character in the story. There's no question about that. But there are there is more than one person to whom the book is addressed. So the recipients are as follows, Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and the church in their home. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 
verses 1 and 2. Those are the people to whom he addresses this letter, although we call it Philemon. If you notice in your Bible, page 270 in the New Testament, <laughs> Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly, dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and, see, and, to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. The church in thy house. We know on a few other occasions Paul will have himself in the introduction accompanied by another individual. Um, and here he has Timothy or another place he'll have Sosthenes and so forth. But the pronouns that are used are all first person singulars. There's I, 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 I's throughout the book. Uh, Timothy is with him in Rome. Timothy's not necessarily a captive, but he's with Paul during Paul's time of Roman captivity, house arrest, Acts 28. But it's a very, very personal letter. Uh, the very nature of the situation, Onesimus and his relationship to this man named Philemon and Paul's relationship to both of them, one a newfound one and one of long-standing relationships I'm speaking of, necessitates the fact that although Paul includes Timothy with him in the introduction, the book is just filled with first-person personal pronouns, I, 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 Paul. Notice in verse uh, 9, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such and one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten, verse 12, whom I have sent, verse 13, whom I would, verse 14, but I would, I would do nothing without your approval. I, I, I. Written by Paul, although Timothy's included, but it's written to Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and the assembly in Philemon's house. So who are these people? Well, I think I've suggested to you before that Aphia is perhaps Philemon's <coughs> wife, and Archippus is perhaps their son, and the church is the church in their home. We know which one that is, not the church down the street, but in thy house. Now, that's a suggestion. I don't know any other way to take. Aphia, by the way, it ends with a feminine ending, an A. I don't know any other way to take Aphia and Archippus here in verse 2. Well, let me say it this way. I don't know any other way to take Aphia. Aphia evidently is Philemon's wife. Archippus is either their son or someone else who in the ministry is related to, that is spiritually related to, Philemon and his wife Aphia. And we've got to remember that whenever the apostles or the prophets gave a scripture, then they spake as the Holy Spirit gave them the things to say. Amen. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. Which means, I mean, there, there are vast implications to that. And I think Jesus picked up on that in Matthew 5 when he said not a jot or tittle will pass away. He didn't just think those big important things like Exodus 20, you know, on the giving of the law or Genesis 1, on the creation narrative, just those big heavyweight things were the important things. But he thought of the whole law as one law, and the whole law came from the mouth of God, and not a jot or tittle would pass away until heaven and earth had passed away. And so in the New Testament, that would mean that things that are here are here for a purpose. Why am I saying that? Well, I'm getting ahead of the story, and we get down to some of the characteristics, which will imply certain principles and even doctrine for the Christian church. But everything is important. Here he's addressing not only a man and his son in a church in their home, but his wife as well. You have all these various extremes in Christianity, uh, or in, let's say, religious movements, and Christianity has not been exempt from some of those extremes, everything from the extremes of women being treated as they are in submitted body bondage groups as chattel property to women being allowed to govern and rule and pastor churches. And the biblical balance is just that, a balance, and it's somewhere in between. Women are fellow heirs. Paul has the highest commendation on numerous occasions for women. Uh, none of us in this church, none of those of us who are men have any letters by Paul addressed to us, but here a woman does, and her name is Aphia. Archippus is also mentioned over in Colossians 4, which would seem to indicate, as we have shown also earlier, and in other ways, that there's a relationship between Philemon 
and Colossians because there is a connection between the place of location of Philemon and the city of Colossae, namely that they're one and the same. Now, I'd like you to turn, if you will, over to, a, to um, the book of Acts. We'll discuss the Ephesian situation in Acts 19 because this seems to be the background to a whole lot of apostolic activity by the Apostle Paul that is not spelled out in so many words by Luke in the book of Acts. But he gives us the fact that Paul camped out at Ephesus longer than any other place on his journey that we have record of. This was like a watering hole, a well of salvation, Paul's ministry at Ephesus, and it spread, as Luke tells us here, abroad throughout all of Asia. I said when we studied Colossians that that was one group one place to whom or to which Paul had never been or visited. And he says that in chapter 2, the first couple of verses. And I think that the way we explain how churches like the church at Colossae and some of those neighboring cities, Hierapolis and Laodicea, and uh, a plurality of them in perhaps each one of those cities, how they were founded by a reference to Acts chapter 19. In Acts 19 after Paul has had a little problem with some of the Jewish people at the synagogue in verse 8, and he finds a school, a Gentile-run school, uh, by one named Tyrannus. He evidently was the leader of the school here, and Paul used the building. And his use continued by the space of two years, verse 10, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles, or Greeks. Now, I'm not going to go through the motions of putting a map up here again for you, but Colossae is a city in Asia, in Asia Minor. And over in Colossians chapter 2 and Colossians chapter 4, then we have a reference to the other sister neighboring cities, now they're more important by the first century A.D., Hierapolis and Laodicea. There's another man not mentioned until we get to the end of the book of Philemon, but who pops up in the very beginning of the book of Colossians, who seems to be a very important individual, and he's difficult to identify precisely by his office or his function, but he seems to be a very important individual, a Christian minister, no doubt, uh, in the ballpark of Colossae and the life of Philemon and his relatives. And that is the man by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras. In Colossians 1, in verse 7, we're told that Epaphras is a Colossian. He is one of them. He is their minister, or one of their ministers. Colossians 1, 7. As you also learned, you know, the grace of God and the truth, verse 6, those things you learned of Paul, no. The Colossian church wasn't founded by Paul, but by someone who did receive the truth from Paul. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Well, you go back in your mind to Acts 19 and the importance of the city of the Ephesians. Remember they had this great temple dedicated to the goddess Artemis, or she's called in the King James Diana. One's a Greek and one's a Roman name or a Latin name for her. And... The silversmiths were losing some of their business because of Paul's preaching, and they were wanting to challenge Paul in his preaching by reference to this fact that this goddess Artemis, who is worshipped by all of Asia, you know, is in uh, peril of ruin or decline, at least attendance at her temple. All of Asia. In other words, what I'm trying to say is Ephesus was a very, very important center, probably the most important city in Asia. How did the people at Colossae, how did Philemon, his family, his household, how did Laodicea, how did Hierapolis, these other sister cities, get the message? Well, some of the people from those cities traveled to Ephesus probably on business or for whatever reason. And they came across the ministry of the Apostle Paul. We're never told that Paul left Ephesus. We're told that Paul camped out in a school. He rented it out or it was loaned to him or whatever uh, of Tyrannus and that by the space of two years he taught the word so that all that were in Asia heard. Well, he didn't go everywhere, and there wasn't radio or television then. 
So Paul must have converted others who converted others who converted others. And those first others had to come to Paul. Paul didn't go to them. So probably Epaphras traveled from Colossae for whatever reason, perhaps business, to Ephesus and was converted and went back and he was responsible for the founding of a church or some churches. Perhaps the same thing happened with Philemon. Philemon doesn't seem to have been converted through the ministry of Epaphras because, as we'll see here later on, Paul ascribes his salvation, Philemon's, in that book, Philemon, to himself, to Paul's ministry, to the apostle Paul himself. So we have this question on our hands. We want to deal with this in the first place, and I'll preface it to say there's no way you can come up with a precise answer. But what was the ministerial status of Epaphras and Philemon? Were they ministers? Were they pastors? <laughs> were they apostles? Just what were these men? We often read that Philemon was a saved, wealthy businessman, wealthy enough to own at least one slave, Onesimus, and perhaps more. And yet in Philemon, chapter 1 and verse 1, Philemon is referred to as a fellow soldier with the Apostle Paul. Now, you can't make everything out of that, and I don't know how far we can always press designations like that, a fellow soldier, because we're all soldiers of the cross, those of us in word ministry and those not. We're all fellow laborers and fellow soldiers. Amen. And uh, Paul refers to some women over in Philippians 4 as, you know, laborers, but he doesn't mean it in the ministerial sense because he said otherwise elsewhere. So I don't know that you can necessarily be certain how far to press these things. Um, but Philemon does have a house and he does have a church in his home and it's certainly possible that he's not only the host of the church but he's a pastor of the group. Although that's not necessarily the way we would have to take it. So here are some various options that we have as to these two men, Epaphras and Philemon. Either, option number one, they are pastors of separate assemblies in Colossae. C-O-L-O-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Pastors of separate assemblies in Colossae. You see you have various implications from that. One thing I think we need to start with is the fact that when Paul is writing Colossians, now here's something probably a lot of people don't know. You people should know by now after the last teaching. When Paul is writing Colossians and he's talking about the church at Colossae and the saints there, it would not be uh, synonymous with him writing the church in Portland because we know of only one, one true church, this church. However, at Colossae, there appear to be various local assemblies there. I mean, it's a large city, larger than the one in which we live. And you evidently have various local assemblies there. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, because you've, you've got Colossians. Here's one book that's being written to the church, the saints at Colossae. Then you've got Philemon. And Philemon is from Colossae, and Philemon has a church in his home. Well, is the church in his home the same one as the church to which Paul writes Colossians, and it's the only one and there aren't any others? Well, Colossians, the four chapters of that book, would seem to indicate otherwise. It's much broader than this one little personal letter written to one man, and it's designated as to not only him but to the church that is in his home. And there's no reference to Epaphras and Philemon as being the pastor of that group. You see, if you turn over to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 9, by the way, Colossians 4 and verse 12 also informs us that Epaphras is a Colossian, not an Ephesian, but he probably got the message there. But Epaphras, who is one of you? Well, what are the yous? Well, they're Colossians. And in Colossians 4, 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? Well, this is the same Onesimus that we're going to read about over in Philemon. And what is he called here? He's a Colossian. So you do have the situation of a plurality of churches in Colossae, various local, separate, but of course related, New Testament assemblies. So perhaps Epaphras is passed over one and Philemon over another. Or another alternative, alternative number two, is Epaphras was an apostle was an apostle over the church or the churches, 
of Colossae, and Philemon was the pastor of one in particular. What could lead some people to that con conclusion is the 12th verse, I just mentioned the first part of it earlier, of Colossians 4, Colossians 4.12. I don't think I've read this before regarding Epaphras. Epaphras, who is one of you, now he was called, you know, their faithful minister, a minister of Christ in 1.7. A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and for them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Wow, he seems to have kind of a broader ministry than just one local man in a local church, a local pastor. He's got a great zeal and intercession and prayer for the saints at Colossae and these two neighboring cities here. Maybe he's functioning as an apostle. And he has relationships with all of these churches, all of these groups in that particular area. That would be a passage that could incline one to that belief. And I don't know that there's any way you can prove one way or the other. Or another alternative is that Epaphras was the pastor of the assembly in Philemon's home. But whenever he went to Rome, remember he had to go to Rome to get some help from the Apostle Paul in dealing with that Colossian heresy? Whenever Epaphras went to Rome, then he had to leave the church in someone's care, charge, and he left it in the care or charge of Philemon, who then is functioning more or less as a pastor of the group. So which of the, or you could, I can think of some other alternatives, but those are three of the chief ones. Which of these is correct? Well, it's impossible to definitely state. But it appears to me that these two men are church leaders. They are Christian ministers. In what capacity... I don't really know. And you have to add with that the fact that Archippus, the son of Philemon, also <laughs> appears to be a minister, which would make Philemon an older man, old enough to at least have a 25 or 30-year-old son. Back to Philemon, the uh, first couple of verses. Verse 2, Archippus, our fellow soldier. See, he called Philemon our fellow laborer, and he calls Aphia beloved, because <laughs> she can't be a minister being a woman, 1 Timothy 2, but she can be beloved, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And then if you hold your finger there and go back to Colossians 4 and 17, listen to this, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Well, you see, it's a little sketchy. Of course, Archippus, he's not in the dark. He knows what ministry has. But we, 20 centuries later, don't know what ministry had. He could have been someone in body ministry and had some good body ministry. And Paul said, make sure that you fulfill that. We know that we all have ministry. Amen. Ephesians 4, 11 and following. The fivefold ministry is there to equip the saints for their ministry, for the work of their ministry. Amen. Ephesians 4, 11. Notice also there must be again a relationship between Philemon or where he is in Colossians or where that city is because Archippus is mentioned in Philemon and Archippus is mentioned over here as well. So to sum all of that up, I'd find it a little difficult to, um, a little difficult to receive the fact that Colossians and Philemon are written to one and the same church and that's a single assembly that met in Philemon's home. Or why not just go ahead and tack on Philemon to Colossians or Colossians to Philemon? But I think what you have are you've got other assemblies there. One of them is Philemon's church, the church that he's over or Epaphras is over and he's been left in charge or whatever. Or Archippus is over. No one really knows. But the church that met in Philemon's home. You've got that epistle to him, and you've got a whole other epistle called Colossians. And yet Philemon is in Colossae, and yet you've got a whole epistle to the Colossians. But maybe another passage that would help iron all of this out, back to Colossians 4, is down in verse 16. When this epistle is read among you, among you Colossians, calls, and it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. In other words, the epistles were spread around and read in the neighboring cities, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. 
Paul must have been writing a Laodiceans around the same time. But you see, Philemon is very personal. It deals with one particular question that relates to Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. Now, if you ask the question, well, why does he address other people in verse 2? Well, we'll come to that here later on. But it's a very personal letter, really, to one man, Philemon, concerning Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. And Colossians, you know, is to the church, to the whole church. And I'll explain whatever inconsistency you might think exists there later on. All right, the purpose of the book of Philemon. The purpose is found in verses 10 through 21. 10 through 21. Philemon, although he's probably a minister, evidently was also a man of means. He owned some property. He had to have a house sufficient to hold a church. Not everyone would have that. And he had at least one slave whose name was Onesimus, who was unsaved at the time. The story is runs something like this. When you read Philemon, you can put all this together. One day, perhaps early in the year A.D. 60, Onesimus absconded with some stolen goods from the household property of Philemon, and he heads to the eternal city of Rome where he can blend in anonymously with the huge slave population that lived there already. And the apostle Paul comes across the path of Onesimus, he is converted under the Apostle Paul's ministry, and Paul, in this very tactful letter of his, knowing that legally, according to Roman law, Onesimus still belongs to Philemon, although Paul has need of Onesimus for uh, various purposes there in Rome, he knows that the best thing to do is to send him back. But he sends him back along with Tychicus, remember, who carries the letter to Colossians, and along with this letter to his master, Hopefully a former one, as Paul is intimating and hinting at here. But he carries this back with the goal in mind that Philemon is going to forgive Onesimus for this transgression, absconding with goods of his, and that he's going to be reconciled to him in a new spiritual relationship. So that's basically what the book is all about. Sometimes you hear this, and it's probably... Um, maybe a little trite, but if someone were to ask you, well, what's Philemon all about? What's the theme of Philemon? People generally say forgiveness. Philemon is a book on forgiveness. Well, I think that's partially true, but it has so much more teaching in it. But definitely I would say that's partially or basically true that Philemon contains good, solid Christian teaching on forgiveness and reconciliation, or to say it another way, on relationships. The one highlighted here being employer-employee, or in those days, slave and master, slave and owner. But it concerns injustice that Philemon has received at the hands of his slave, Onesimus. Onesimus has fled with goods belonging to him, evidently, and Philemon is, by the Apostle Paul, asked to forgive him and to reconcile, and uh, perhaps, as the Apostle Paul will hint later on, perhaps he can even have a change in his relationship with him. Well, you know, Rome's a big city, and Onesimus is one man. How did he ever meet Paul? And Paul was under house arrest. You've got a million people there in Rome. You've got one slave out of just countless slaves, some runaway and some not, some there with their masters in Rome, but a large host of slaves, Paul's under house arrest. Paul is not allowed to travel around and go look for people to witness to. They have to come to him. So how did the two ever meet up? Well, no one knows that because we're not told. But here are some suggestions, various alternatives. Number one, Epaphras, who remember is from Colossae, but he's now with Paul in Rome, may have come across Onesimus, keep the names separate now, Epaphras and Onesimus, and Epaphras may have recognized him in Rome. See, he was from that area. He knew Philemon because Paul salutes him, salutes Philemon from Epaphras in verse 23. There, 
salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. So Epaphras may, Epaphras may have seen him. But one problem with that is that Epaphras is also under house arrest with Paul. Again, verse 23, my fellow prisoner. My fellow prisoner. And so the second alternative, and nobody really knows because we're not told how Onesimus and Paul ever ran into one another, except in God's providence they did. And I mean, what a... And let's go back to say this. Onesimus probably knew of the Apostle Paul because Philemon knew Paul. Philemon had been converted through Paul's ministry. And although Onesimus had never been converted, or he wouldn't have run away. You don't run away and steal from your master if you're a saved slave. You obey Colossians 4. that says, slaves, you know, obey your masters in all things as unto the Lord, not with eye service as men pleasers, but do it unto the Lord. For the continuation of this message, Obey Colossians 4 that says, Slaves, you know, obey your masters in all things as unto the Lord, not with eye service as men pleasers, but do it unto the Lord. Onesimus knows Paul. Onesimus probably knows that Paul is in Rome under house arrest. Philemon certainly knows that. The other churches established by or related to the Apostle Paul, they all know that. Do you see what I'm saying? Onesimus would have known that. And Paul doesn't have to know Onesimus because he's never been to Philemon's house. But Onesimus knows Paul. And he knows that Paul is under house arrest. And he probably knows various other things about the Apostle Paul. So I would say that this is probably the best alternative, that Onesimus no doubt knew of Paul because his master knew Paul and had been saved under his ministry. He probably knew that he was being held in Rome. Uh, According to a verse we'll get to here in a moment, he evidently stole some of Philemon's valuable goods, you know, like the silverware. (laughs) He probably got in the china cabinet and took some of the silverware with him. And, you know, you've got to have something to live on as a slave that's a runaway. And he gets to Rome, and he has to sell the goods to get money to live on after a while. The money derived from selling his stolen goods is running low. So he's probably got a financial need now as a runaway slave in Rome. It's not easy to get a job. Oh, you want a job? Well, what's your former occupation? Well, I'm a runaway slave. Well, that's against the law. I'll turn you in and get a reward for that. So the money that he derived from selling stolen goods has probably run out. He has a financial need coupled with, I would guess, a troubled conscience. See, he had been under good Christian influence. Philemon, Aphia, Archippus. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to be in Aunt Jemima where you've got a saved master and a master's wife and maybe their son and he's a pastor and his son is a minister and the church meets in their home jemima would be saved in a hurry i think in a place like that onesimus wasn't he was rather hard of heart and cold of spirit until he had a need and his conscience then began to bother him this is just speculation nobody knows how he met the apostle paul but i'm trying to show you the apostle paul couldn't go out looking for him and epaphras couldn't go out looking for him the only man that we know that knew him was epaphras And he couldn't go out looking for him. So Onesimus had to come looking for Paul or Epaphras or both. And he had ways of finding out where they were. And so why did he go? Well, he's not just going to go to ask for a handout because Epaphras or Paul may collar him and send him back to his master, which is what Paul does. But not until he first gets him saved. So I would say he probably went with a troubled conscience. So think what that says now. I can prove some of this from the book itself that Onesimus, as a runaway slave, left in the state of being unsaved. And by the time he comes back, he's born again. Paul wouldn't be giving a letter to an unsaved person and trusting its care to him. He's saved now. So what should that say of people around us then? But that we should have a godly influence upon them. Matthew 5, light to all those that are in the house. And it may take a little time for the light to penetrate. And it took this man leaving. Sometimes you have to lose him to gain him, right? That's exactly what Paul's going to teach here, the very teaching of Jesus in Matthew 16, the very teaching that we've been on on Friday nights around here. Look at verse 15. For perhaps he therefore, we can add in the word had, the pluperfect, for perhaps he therefore had to depart for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. 
In other words, Paul's saying perhaps that's the way that it had to be. You know the teaching on household salvation. You claim them, but that doesn't necessarily mean they come and start weeping at your feet the next day. <laughs> Sometimes, and they won't be throwing roses at your feet the next day either. Sometimes they'll be throwing axes at your skull. And Paul said, perhaps. Notice the Apostle Paul doesn't know, but he's just saying perhaps this was the way it had to be. And sometimes we say it that way. You have to lose. Jesus said it that way. You have to lose sometimes to gain. But she's leaving me, or he's running away, or it's my adolescent son who's out on drugs. Well, perhaps that's the way that it has to be. We would want it to be another way for him to come up as just a shining, newly minted nickel in the faith where he's not got any nicks on him at all, but maybe he's going to make a better, maybe God knows him and God knows his own will and purposes and plans well enough to know that he's got to get in that drug culture. Now, maybe God, Paul said, perhaps this had to happen this way. That doesn't mean it's the best way for, you know, all of the theological thoughts that you might have, but maybe it is the best way for that person. You just have to let go and let God. Perhaps... He therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. This book, friends, I would encourage you to get into it. It's just filled with teaching on Christian conduct and Christian doctrine. Just filled with it. Little verses like this. Perhaps. That's almost like, well, by chance, I guess, although he means in God's providence. He therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Well, we know that he had become, after his salvation in Rome under Paul's ministry, very profitable to Paul in ministering to his physical needs. Verses 11 and 13. Verses 11 and 13. Which in time past, speaking of Onesimus, was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Oh, he's profitable to Paul. And then look at verse 13. Whom I would have retained with me. Paul desired to keep him there. That in thy stead, in your place, Philemon, he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. In other words, in Paul's state of being under house arrest, Onesimus was serving some function of ministry to the apostle Paul. Now, hold on to your seats for this suggestion from the commentators. It may be right. Nobody knows. But several of them have suggested that Onesimus, having been a slave, was perhaps a chef. Huh, a good cook. Paul liked good food. He somehow ministered to Paul's physical needs because Paul said, he's a prophet to me, and I wanted to keep him here to minister to me in the bonds of the gospel. Well, Paul doesn't need anybody to read him scripture. He's writing all of it himself. Or to encourage him in the faith, he doesn't need any of that. He needs someone for physical reasons, for physical ministry. So some have suggested that Onesimus was an excellent chef. So maybe he did take the silverware. <laughs> ah, I got you on that one. I wasn't so far off after all. Well, we're not told. You say, where's that verse that says he was a chef? Well, that's in verse 26 of Philemon. All right, let's get it all at one time now. You get a delayed response. Five seconds later, way in the back, someone looking down. Let's see, my Bible doesn't have verse 26. I wonder what he's talking about. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Paul knows that he legally belongs to the man Philemon, and so he has to return him. And uh, legally, by Roman law, and out of Christian courtesy, Paul returns him as well. Verse 14, but without thy mind, what I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to keep Onesimus and write you and say, I know that you'd want me to do this. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do and say whatever you want to do and say. So his purpose in writing, let's sum it up like this for the purpose. His purpose in writing is to ask Philemon to receive Onesimus back, to forgive him, to reconcile, and to receive him back in a new relationship. That is, as a brother in Christ. Look at verse 16. It's a beautiful book. It's one of the sweetest books you could find in the, well, the whole Bible, not only the New Testament. 
Paul's asking him to receive him back. Verse 16, not now as a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved. Why do we call one another Brother Ross or Sister Jones around here? Because it's what the Bible does. Because we're brothers and sisters. We got that terminology right out of the Bible. It's not like the Franciscans would call themselves brother or something like that. It's a true brotherhood in Jesus Christ. Right. And you know, the world can't understand that. The world, they, they can't even understand Christian terminology. You'll be out somewhere, and, and you notice this, in public with the heathen, and we call them heathen. We don't mean anything pejorative by that. That's the state we were all in at one time. But you'll see one of the people from the church, and you'll say, oh, hello, brother. You'll say, well, we'll see you later, Sister Smith. And people at the cash register look at you, Sister Smith. I mean, you don't even call your own sister Sister Smith. You just say Smith, whatever her name is. You don't call her sister whatever. And they hear us calling one another sister and brother. Well, it sounds like a little, you know, uh, close-knit. Well, we are. We're part of the family of God. Paul said, don't receive him back as a slave, but now as a brother beloved. Especially to me, Paul said, but how much more unto thee? Watch this in verse 16 in the end, both in the flesh and in the Lord. In other words, the uh, physical ministry that he could still do for Philemon, remember he was a chef, and he's also a brother, a blessing. See, not only a, a blessing in the flesh, but now a brother and a blessing in the Lord. Paul tells Philemon that he will pay for any loss or damage that has been caused by Onesimus' departure by night. Verse 18, if he hath wrong there, oweth thee aught, then put it on mine account. And yet, very subtly, in verses 19 through 21, he expects that Philemon will not charge him. <laughs> Now, let me give you some characteristics. We're going to spend the rest of our time here. Some characteristics of the little short, brief, sweet epistle of Philemon. Some of the characteristics will have principles that extend from them, and others are just characteristics. First of all, it's the shortest of all of Paul's epistles. One of the shortest books in the New Testament or in the Bible, we could say. It's the shortest of all of Paul's epistles. Secondly... It's the most personal. It's the most personal of Paul's epistles in that Paul acts as the perfect Christian gentleman. Now, 2 Corinthians is very personal because you get all of the anguish of Paul's heart, but there's no anguish in this book. It's a sweet, gentle, humble book. So I would say it's the most personal of Paul's epistles in that Paul plays the role of the perfect Christian gentleman. We have a full, vivid picture, not of Paul the theologian, but of Paul the Christian man. You know, in Romans, he's Paul the theologian. Paul with all of his theological depth and variety and insight. Philemon, not Paul the theologian, Paul the normal, ordinary, elderly Christian gentleman. Paul the aged. A third characteristic, it contains one of the sweetest biblical teachings on forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, Jesus has some of that in Matthew 18 with the 70 times 7 teaching on forgiveness. And there's teaching on forgiveness, uh, well, even by Paul elsewhere in the New Testament. But I don't think you'll find anything as sweet or as gentle as the teaching on forgiveness and reconciliation and relationships that you find here in the book of Philemon. Uh, in the next place, another characteristic of the book, this is one of the New Testament bases for our view that considering various circumstances, the New Testament church should meet in the home considering various circumstances, such as the size of the assembly and the size of the available homes, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should meet in a home. Or let's flesh that out a little more. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not some 
structural building. It's not an organization. It's not some cold, formal dinosaur that we have around us today called denominationalism, the Lutheran church where nobody knows nobody and everybody loves it that way. Or the Roman Catholic church or the Presbyterian church where everything is staid and formal and, well, all planned out. The bulletin, you cannot violate the bulletin. If you add to it or subtract from it, they'll add or subtract the curses on your life to the church bulletin. Everything is done on cue. You rise and sit on cue, as we've so often said. You sing or shut up on cue, or you give or don't give on cue. If there's one thing that's lacking, it's the informality that you'll find in a New Testament home, New Testament church, where people can give one another a kiss of charity, as the Bible teaches. You might be arrested in your average church for doing that where they can call one another brother or sister. Now, I know in some churches you can call some people father. But that's the wrong. Jesus said, don't do that. He said, call one another brother or sister. Whenever Ananias came to this man who wrote this book, Paul, he was named Saul. Then he said, brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus had appeared to thee, has appeared to me. They're always calling one another brother or sister. So the various implications of the church in the home speak of the the closeness, the warmth, the fellowship, the informality, the spontaneity, the reality of the church in the New Testament, which is to be duplicated in the church today, if it's a New Testament church. And we know those things are the very things that are lacking in other churches, and those sometimes are the very things that draw people to churches like this. There's warmth here. Look at all the children. They're not shuttled off to some spider-infested basement room to be fed juice and crackers and make flannel graphs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they're here, taught the word of God. Jesus said that children make up the kingdom. Of such is the kingdom of heaven, the little children. So you, had, you see all the implications of the church in the home. Do you remember the first time you ever walked into the church in the home? <laughs> it was a new thing. The Lord had truly done a new thing, as Isaiah said. It was a new thing that God had done. Well, it's old, it's a biblical pattern, but it's new in light of what we see around us today. And if it isn't a church in the home, at least it was a Bible study in the home or a prayer breakfast over some woman's kitchen table. And what a blessing those things are. When you go to church, you've got pews and people have robes on, you feel so uncomfortable and stiff. And that's why there's no body ministry, because it's all discouraged. There's a professional clergy, a professional choir. They do all the ministering and they entertain you. And the church and the home is just the opposite of that. And you won't ever produce in those big buildings what you can have without even trying to produce it by saying, let's torch it and meet down at Joe Smith's garage or Mary Sue's basement or their living room or whatever. You don't even have to try to produce it. Just start meeting in a home. Now, sometimes you can add the extreme that everything becomes so informal that there's no divine order because we say, well, this isn't church. This is just meeting in a home. That is church. You know, some charismatics don't even realize that. I said in a recent teaching that whenever some people get the baptism, they come out of a denominational church, at least in their thinking, at least in part of their thinking, then one of the first things that they begin to think about is, well, now, if we're going to, we, we can't be a Lutheran anymore because we're spirit-filled and Lutheranism isn't in the Bible, so if we're going to establish a church or form a church, we've got to find a building for it. And they go immediately looking for something with a steeple and stained glass windows. That's the mentality they've been brought up with. And they have a difficult time of conceiving that. I mean, what are people's thoughts whenever they think that you meet in a home? That aren't there certain stigmas attached to that? Like, well, it's unofficial. It's unorthodox. It's unauthorized. It's somehow less than what it could be or should be. It's somehow off the beaten path. And, and all of those aren't... Uh, praiseworthy designations or terms, they're used pejoratively. You're less than orthodox. Uh, you're, you're less than, you're not authorized. There's something, you know, well, different, but they mean different in an evil sense. You have various stigmas attached to you or to your group whenever you get out of a church building, quote unquote, and you move into a barn or a home or a basement or an attic or an apple grove. You have certain stigmas attached to you. And I don't know, but I would say a lot of people probably have to 
have the Lord root out of their minds some of those false conceptions, even though they desire not to think that way anymore, when they come into a church in the home, and it's not a big building that seats a thousand people, and it's just a church in the home, you know, somehow there's, it's just not quite, well, what? Not quite what? Not quite right in their eyes. A church in the home. But you know, all we're accustomed to is a church in a big building somewhere. And we me in other words, that's the standard. That's what's right, people say. We measure everything against that criterion. But you see, what our criterion should be is the Word of God. Amen. Not some tradition that men have established. You don't find church buildings or cathedrals until the 4th century A.D. They met as they met in New Testament days in the home. And you know what the counter arguments are? Well, we just have so many people. That's why we have to have a building. And generally, 99% of the time, you can respond to that argument this way. If you'd preach the word of God, you wouldn't have so many people. Amen. Because, you know, some pastor of a church, a Baptist church, that on the membership roll, you couldn't see them in a football stadium if you had one. You know, there are 50,000 people or a quarter of a million people that belong to that church. A quarter of a million people? Well... How'd you get all of them there? If you didn't compromise, you got all of them there? Praise God. But I wonder sometimes. I know if it's a 25,000-member Southern Baptist church, if you'd preach the Word, you'd lose most of those people. So then your old argument, we've got to have a building that's got uh, 18 million red bricks that make it up here. Your argument would evaporate into thin air if you just preach the Word of God. I hope none of us in this church still has that false conception in our mind. Somehow being in a home... You know, this is not a real church. You know, a church, well, a church is the way it is in the Bible, not the way it is that we see around us today. And what do we have? Well, Philemon, verse 2, to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. And to the church in thy house. So let me give you a few other passages while we're on that. Over in Colossians 4 again, one of the neighboring cities. Colossians 4 and verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea in Nymphos and the church which is in his house. How do you like that? A lot of home churches in this Lycus Valley region where we find the cities of Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. Nymphos and the church which is in his home. And then over in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their home. And Romans chapter 16 and verse 5, likewise greet the church that is in their house. Romans 16, 5. Likewise greet the church that is in their house. Well, there are several, a whole handful of New Testament references to the fact that the early believers met in homes, if that were possible, they would gather in other places if it were not. I want to give you a little history of something. I probably have shared this before. If I have, it's worth repeating. If I haven't, then I guess it's time to share it. And if I have, maybe there's some of you here who haven't heard it, though. You know, we used to meet back in our beginning days in a church building. Uh, that was, I didn't have anything to do with that, and it's no criticism of those who had something to do with it. That was probably their mentality at the time, or if it wasn't, that was probably the only choice that they had. But it's probably what they thought at the time. You're going to start a group and you're going to become an official church and we got all these people and we got to move out of the home. Now, they met in the home at one time. And again, I go back and say, if you really preach the word, because whenever some of us got here and started doing that, then we emptied, we lost all those people. You could have stayed in the home, taught the word, and you would have plenty of room to meet for a while longer anyway. But for whatever reasons, no criticism there. A church building was located out in another town where they felt God was calling them to establish a church. And we, we've got to find a church building now. And see, we've all been uh, delivered from those, I hope we all have, delivered of those thoughts years ago. This is an old hat to us. But look, charismatic people, even when you're charismatic, you come out of the system, you still think that way. I'll tell you what a lot of pastors think. I'll tell you, I am one. I know how they think, well, you've got to attract people. And you're not going to attract people. You're not going to get visitors there by meeting in somebody's basement where there's children or there's spider webs hanging down. You've got to have something that, you know, uh, that is appealing to the flesh. You know how you would naturally think. You've got to have something appealing to the flesh or you want to attract visitors. And so if you want to get churchy people in there, you've got to meet in a church. <laughs> 
And the one thing we don't want are churchy people. Amen. So we don't meet in one. We don't attract that crowd. <laughs> Notice we hadn't had any of the Roman Catholics beating our door down or something. You only have people who are hungry, who want to get off the old beaten path of dry, dead, formal denominationalism and look for something that has a little life and joy and victory in it. And you might find it sitting next to a boiler or next to a fireplace. You might find it in someone's home rather than in a church building. Well, you know, we met there for a while, and uh, I believe that the Lord can still bless a group in a church building. If you'll serve him in truth and sincerity, he'll bless you wherever you are. You can be in a stall for donkeys or in a church building, and he'll bless you. And so we were greatly blessed there. But, you know, the word that we were preaching was not exactly compatible with the building in which we were meeting. Everything we said, everything we were doing, everything we stood for was against everything related to denominationalism, including a big mammoth, behemoth, dinosaur building with a steeple and stained glass windows. And so we were teaching in a, in a series on... Um, uh, end time and what God was doing and renewing the church and various restoration things from Acts 321 and it was in that series you see that we moved out of that building we made a dramatic movement we moved out of that building and moved into the biblical pattern of the church in the home uh, yeah, the reason I'm harping on this for a while is there must be some reason why God has that there the church in the home the church in the home it doesn't have to be a home but it's got to be something that will carry the same overtures of a home, anything but a church building, but a medieval castle or fortress, like a lot of these buildings are, where there's anything but uh, spontaneity and warmth and informality. And you know how or the reason or the background that led us out of that? Well, it happened to be during that winter, that very winter, that I was preparing the notes for this class, New Testament Introduction. I was preparing the notes for this class, and I was working on Philemon. And, you know, I knew, I knew I'd been a part of a church and a met in a home, and I knew all about that. I'd heard Dr. Freeman's teaching. I had the Charismatic Body Ministry book, and that, I was all in favor of that. But coming into a situation that I did in Minnesota that was already existent, I never gave it too much thought, you know, worth doing anything about. I wasn't the leader, so there wasn't really anything I could do or say anyway. And coming into an existing situation, I didn't really give it any thought. We were being blessed there, and I was happy. But in studying New Testament introduction, I was studying, preparing these very notes you're hearing tonight on Philemon. These very notes you're hearing tonight in a home church on Philemon. And I got down to that second verse, and greet the church in your home. And I knew that. I knew where the other passages were. Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, Colossians 4, the four basic ones along with Philemon 2. I knew where those were. I could have told you right then. If you would ask me where are some passages on the church and the home, I could have told you that. But the Holy Spirit really zeroed in on that in my heart. And um, I was in a position where I could do something about it at that time, and so it didn't take long. <laughs> we don't take long whenever the Lord shows us this is what the Word says, that the church meets in the home, and we just say, all right, we're going to meet in a home. We started meeting in a home, and you know what? And we lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's the end of that story. We've been blessed ever since then. So I don't know if I've told you that. If I haven't, this is an appropriate time since that Philemon and preparing notes for this was the very cause for getting us out of that building in the first place. And here, however many years later that's been, five or six years later, we're finally studying Philemon and Paul's blessing here on the church in his home. This message will be continued on the following tape.